Hello, welcome to Resilience Radio. I'm your host, Irvin Eisenberg, owner of Resilience Occupational Therapy and host of the show. As always, the opinions on this show are not meant to be prescriptive or diagnostic in any way, and I don't necessarily endorse any particular ideas. I like to just showcase a variety of different perspectives. Two weeks ago, I did an episode with Susan Yebra, a doctorate in occupational therapy who specializes in pelvic health. In today's episode, we continue that conversation um, talking about um, bottom gender affirmation surgeries as well as gender in occupation. And as an occupational therapist, what gender and sexuality, how that plays a role into therapeutic practice. So it's my understanding that you have um, you work with a lot of transgender clients, and it looks like as part of your education, you did some gender and occupation research. Can you, or or education in any case, could you speak to gender in occupation? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, when I did my post professional. Uh, capstone project. Um, I, you know, they say pick something that you can live with right for nine months. And, um, I had taken a cultural competency course as like an elective. And I realized going through that, that like the section on, uh, gender and sexuality, like I knew the least about, and it really intrigued me because I was like, well, as an OT, first off in my experience, like, you know, we know sex is an ADL, but we never talk about it. Like I had never talked about it really with patients ever. Um, and I was like, if I don't know this much, like, I wonder what other OTs know or don't know, right. Lack thereof. Or so I started to do a little digging. And then as I had to narrow down a capstone topic, it just so happened that I knew I was going to work in public health here in Burlington. So I was like, I wonder, I wonder like what we know, you know, as OTs, like, do if I don't know this about like LGBTQ population, like even just, you know, like pronouns and terminology and like the history, do other OTs know? I kind of felt like I was just like, I was really kind of perseverating on this. I was like, I just feel like I'm out of the loop. Right. So I started to do some, like, you know, go along with the assignments and do some like preliminary research. And it turns out that many OTs don't like, if you survey OTs and literature will tell you this over and over, like, OTs, it'll tell you two things. One, that OTs do not feel comfortable with working mostly with LGBTQ population. Um, And then the research will say like, the way to combat that is to do continuing education and like educate yourself. But then when you look at what's out there for education and CEUs, and I know because I did this as part of my capstone, I looked up any type of CEU, free paid synchronous, asynchronous, anything that I could find um, on any type of LGBTQ plus topic by any discipline. And I compiled a table and I found one that was by an OT student for OTs. Um, Everything else was borrowed. So even from like radiology, obstetrics, gynecology, any other discipline, social work, sociology, um, psychology, but like little to nothing for OTs by OTs. Um, so then from there, I was in a few groups like online, I did utilize social media for this, but I did a few needs assessments, Mm -hmm. um, just to see like what other people's opinions were and what their comfort level was. And like, if, if there was a way to close any of those gaps, like what gap would they close? Um, and I did throw in some, some, some of the things I think on there were like, do you want to know more about like terminology and pronouns? Or do you want to know more about um, how to support a patient who is non-operative transgender with like binding or packing or tucking or things like that? Or do you want to just be able to help um, maybe a non-operative trans client, like figure out gestures, right? So I interviewed 
I interviewed a bunch of different healthcare professionals actually for this project, um, anyone who would give me their time. And I did speak with one speech therapist who works with um, transgender youth. And she talked a lot about the overlap between speech and OT and like the nonverbal communication and like the gender and the posture and like the hand motions, right? Like how, I think one example was like how a, man, um, like a male looks at their hand versus like a female, right? Like, so there are those like kind of nonverbal ways that we communicate. Um, so yeah. So does that kind of answer your, answer your question? Yeah, so like, it gives me I, a, a, yeah. a good sense of sort of the research you did yeah. on that. Um, yeah. I wanted to just sort of unpack a little more. Um, I, I'm familiar, obviously, with terms like ADLs and such as yeah. as a oh, yeah, OT, sorry. and I have found it very interesting. So ADLs is activities of daily living, and in sort of the hierarchy, or I don't know if it's exactly would be described as a hierarchy, but the different types of occupations that OTs engage in, um, that the people engage in, that OTs work with, um, ADLs are supposed to be considered the most basic activities of daily living, are eating, are bathing, are dressing. Um, and it's very interesting that sexuality, sex, um, either um, self-gratification or sexuality with another person is put under um, ADLs. And I think it was a very conscious choice by the by occupational therapists, but then it kind of stops there. It isn't really. It's maybe a paragraph in some of the main textbooks, and it's there's a little bit of lip service paid to it, but very little <laughs> actually yeah. discussed. And as I guess, it seems like there's two pieces to what you're. To, to sort of your journey and what your practice is. One is specifically the gender and um, LGBT um, and sort of the, and looking at what is gender. And then there's just the the sexuality and those are mm -hmm. related to each other, obviously, right. but they're not the same thing. Right, right. Um, exactly. Yeah, I guess um, I wanted to sort of clarify that and get into a little bit of what, um, what supports you might be offering from a pelvic floor standpoint for yeah. trans individuals and how that might be different. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think I do it. So is so kind of more fluidly now, but right along that line, like gender, yeah, gender and sexuality can be very different, um, different things and mean very different things to different people. Um, so I think one of the biggest things that when I ask, when I have a patient, I'm doing like an initial evaluation. So the first time I'm meeting a patient who identifies as trans, um, one of the big things is, you know, we need to know what kind of anatomy they have. Okay, what that is. And then I always ask them, this is kind of a side note, but like, so how do you refer to that? Like, what terms do you want me to use? Do you want me to use this medical terms or do you have a name? Right. And I even have like a handout that's just got like an outline of a body and, you know, it's got options and you can kind of fill it in if you want to. Like, so for a patient that's very particular or has their own kind of names or terminology for things. Um, so if I have a patient, that has, for example, has a vagina. Um, I'll talk to them about, so obviously like they have the vagina, but what do they want that for? Like, what is the end, right? Do they want penetration or not? Um, and if they do, um, what, right? Like there's different ways to achieve penetration. Um, individually with someone. And, and so I have to ask those kind of questions, um, to see, because it's going to change my goals. Um, if a patient is having pain and they only want to be able to tolerate a certain depth or width of something, then that's as far as we're going to go. We don't need to go through like a whole dilator set and dilators are just, um, just plastic pieces that progress in, in size, um, to help kind of desensitize the, the vagina to allow, um, a pain free penetration, essentially. Um, so if a patient and I do this with even, you know, like a, a cisgender person with a vagina too, um, you know, if their end goal is one size, then that's as far as we go. So, yeah. And there's, you know, I'll, I'll also ask, you know, about like, not necessarily even like sexual relationship relationships, right? Like also like about, you know, the other relationships in their life too, and how, and if there's any way to have people in their close circle, like to support, um, to support them. Um, yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was a fairly open-ended question, but okay. intentionally. So <laughs> I could go, I could like go on a tangent. So <laughs> yeah, and I guess the um, we to sort of on, uh, this season, I happen to have, and I think last season as well, conversations about trans, um, trans as it pertains to health and in, in different ways does seem mm-hmm. to keep coming up, um, and just couple quick terminology things for for guests is cisgender sort of the gender assigned at birth matches how you feel transgender is yeah. that that your gender assigned at birth doesn't it, there's a mismatch in mm-hmm. in your identity um and transgender doesn't necessarily mean that there's been any biological changes or alterations be that hormone um mm-hmm. or otherwise and then and I know that you do some work with people post bottom surgery. And I don't know if you could speak yeah. to that a little bit and what that entails and what type of work you might do regarding that. Yeah. Um, so, so in my, I guess, practical experience, I have seen more um, individuals opt for just upper body surgery. So that's a mastectomy. Um, and so in, there are many options as far as the lower body surgery. And I'll preface this by saying like, I, yes, I identify as cisgender. So I, I don't have any of the lived experience of like the tra- of a transgender individual. Um, this is really just coming from like my experience with the research, but also working one-on-one with my patients. Um, so as far as like the surgeries themselves, yes, there are, um, you know, vaginal plasty, which is, um, you know, disassembly of the penis and scrotum to create a, a vaginal opening. Um, there are different ways to do that, different kind of techniques, um, different, um, you know, you can use the, the tissue from the penis, or you can use part of the intestine is sometimes used. Um, it really depends on the client and like their goal at the end. Um, some things allow for more natural lubrication. Um, typically like, for example, like a patient with a vaginoplasty would require frequent dilation. So you need to keep that air that area patent. Um, and so dilation in the literature, it's very dependent on the surgeon. Um, but typical dilation protocols will have you doing this a couple of times a day. So what that means is using that tool or that dilator, inserting it, um, several times a day, there's different ways to do that. Um, Sometimes you can stretch the tissue. Sometimes you can just insert and just kind of leave it there. Um, and then you just work your way up to your end goal, like whatever depth and width that is, you know, you want to be achievable for you, um, in your future goals. Um, patients who I've also had patients who, um, don't do surgery, uh, but will do hormones. Um, and so hormones, some things that I have seen are, I am by no means, uh, an expert in injections at all, but what I have seen is injection site issues, um, where I'm either referring them back to their physician. Um, if they're doing injections in their leg, they could be hitting, um, like if it's not supposed to be intramuscular, but they're hitting muscle, they're developing a pain response. And then they're having like tight, like myofascial restrictions. So sometimes we're doing like foam rolling or something like that. Um, testosterone use in and of itself will, uh, make the clitoris enlarged. It will grow. Um, that can either be kind of the max that someone wants to do, or they could also, um, go for a metoidoplasty. So that would be where they, um, take the clitoris and get it large. Okay. And they actually build kind of like a shaft. So it's referred to in the literature as a micro penis. Um, so you can sometimes perform standing micturition, sometimes not long enough, not really long enough for penetration. Um, but sometimes it is, you know, what the patient wants, right. Um, There's also phalloplasty, which is essentially the creation of a penis. There are many different surgical techniques for that requiring um, 
skin flaps um, or grafts from other places in the body. So sometimes as an OT, like they'll use um, just something to like think about is like a radial forearm flap. So they'll take tissue from the forearm. So then of course, like you have, you know, graft care, right. Or, um, you know, just muscle range of motion kind of forearm stuff, right. And more orthopedic kind of side. Um, so there's definitely different options depending on like the importance uh, that it has to each client. Um, a someone that goes from being biologically female may or may not want to have a vaginectomy, um, and that is closure of the vaginal opening. Um, and so basically what that means is the levator ani muscle, the muscle that is technically the third layer of the pelvic floor, which controls some of the rectum, um, and it kind of goes around the vagina, um, is actually kind of spreads out and instead they kind of close it. Um, so then again, we could see some issues with that, with like pain or tightness or tension, um, some people want to leave that open and still have a phalloplasty. So they would essentially have uterus, everything, because they want to maybe have a child, right? Um, I was reading just the other day that there's an option to uh, have a phalloplasty, but leave the clitoris um, in place. They just move it a little bit, but like still have a clitoris and have a penis. I was like, wow, like there's just so many different, different things. So I think for many patients, it's really important to find like, a surgeon, right. That like you have a really good relationship with and you feel comfortable asking and like knowing all of the options because there are, there are so many, but depending on the type of surgery, depending on if there's a catheter in place, sometimes even just having a catheter for a long period of time, patients can have like develop incontinence or, um, oversensitivity of the bladder or hypersensitivity. And so we're working on techniques for, um, you know, managing bladder irritants or, um, retraining the bladder that, you know, we don't need to pee every, uh, 45 minutes, right. We can need to like work on techniques to like, we call it ride the wave, right? Like, so you're not going to the bathroom so frequently. Um, so yeah, so there's, that's kind of, you know, the, the gender affirming surgery stuff. Um, and like I said, it's just, yeah, it's, there's so many different options and not, and then some people don't, some people don't want to have any surgery or they want to have a non-binary appearance, which would mean maybe they get a vaginal plasty, but it has like little to no depth. So some people want to achieve, right. Cause if we're just reinforcing the binary, some people want to achieve something that's rather neutral too. Okay. So it seems like there's, there is a plethora of, <laughs> of options surgically and hormonally and, mm -hmm. and otherwise for people. And where, what is your role in, in, are you often seeking, seeing people after they've gone through one of these and working on function as far as pelvic floor function and continence, and even as you're saying, arm range of motion might yeah. come into yeah. that. Um, and how much are you guiding people to educating them what their options are yeah. and, yeah. and sort of prehab available yeah. for them? So after surgery, um, just like even after, if we have a patient who has birth or like even just a hysterectomy, right. Which can be gender affirming or not. Um, we typically like hysterectomy, you won't see a patient for like 10 to 12 weeks after surgery. So we're not really working with there. There are, you know, in the literature, we'll talk about this a little bit. Like there are, there's kind of like the acute side things you can do. And then more of like the outpatient, like longer term things. Um, so really by the time a patient gets here, it's like an outpatient clinic, it's been a while since they've had the surgery. So at that point, it's more, it's more, I, it's more ADL, like those activities of daily living, but also like starting to transition to the IADL, which is the instrumental activity of daily living. So those are like a little bit more complex activities, which often, um, you know, involve other people or a community or like return to work or things like that. Um, so like for one example, you know, it might just be if we're working on something with the bladder after surgery, it might just be like, okay, if someone's working from home, um, is the bathroom too accessible to where they're going to the bathroom every five minutes and now they're retraining their bladder and now they're having these issues or the opposite. 
is there a place or a space at their school or work where they're comfortable going to the bathroom? Is the bathroom, is a gender neutral bathroom accessible to them? Um, so it could be something like that. Um, it could be positioning, right? So like returning to intercourse, right? Um, maybe they're doing fine, but then when they go to do something with penetration, like they're having discomfort, right? So it could be that kind of you know, the, the, you know, as you mentioned a little bit that we talk about in OT school, right? Like the positioning, right? So it could be troubleshooting positioning. Is there an angle that is causing them pain? Is there something that they're doing or not doing? Or do we need to perhaps look at like different positioning or maybe like just as simple as like emptying the bladder before intercourse. Um, so there's those kinds of things. Um, the dilation, which I mentioned is a big one. That one you have to do, you have to do dilation pretty much for uh, the rest of your life. So that's more of a kind of a long-term. Um, then sometimes it's things like a patient is, you know, developing maybe, it's a big stressor for them, like returning to work or like as a new, like outward appearance, a new gender, right? To their coworkers or returning to like church or something like that or to family, right? So there's stressors um, and everyone like holds their attention. Like, so maybe they're developing like issues with their bowel movements, like their bowel patterns, right? And so it might just be looking at, taking a log and like logging bowel movements and looking at the bristle stool chart and what are the, like, how would you rate each bowel movement? Um, so I think, I mean, there's, it's endless, <laughs> really a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So it seems like anyone who, it seems like there, there may be aspects that people don't think of as conventional therapy that, that you could be helping with mm -hmm. post, um, post or pre these types of surgeries on um, these yeah. gender affirmation surgeries. And I'm yeah. imagining that also goes for, um, for just any pelvic floor concern in yeah. general, or yeah. any of these surgeries that were maybe um, not desired when someone has a hysterectomy and, or some other right. um, surgery that, that affects their pelvic floor, that might be things you'd be working with as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like hysterectomy is a great example. We see some patients pre hysterectomy, um, for whatever reason, they're having a hysterectomy. Um, the literature in the, you know, looking in terms of like gender affirming surgery, the literature does, you know, nowhere does it speak about OT, but it does every now and again, there was something regarding physical therapy, um, and that prehab, right? So if we can, check the muscle tone before surgery and start providing exercises, how to elongate those muscles. If there's a lot of tone, um, how to do some self trigger point release pre-surgically, then the outcomes are shown to be better post-surgically. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It was a yeah, pleasure getting to know about this and getting to meet you. Yes, great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to Resilience Radio. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, you can like us on Facebook, Resilience Occupational Therapy, and you can leave comments and check up future posts and future episodes from there. Our music was brought to you by Aaron Marcus with their tune, Some Biological Process. You can check the show notes for full credits on that. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Take care.